Hi everyone, welcome to A Journey with Recursion. I'm Frankie and it's nice to meet you all. Myself and Marjan are software developers for the Guardian's mobile app and we predominantly work on the server side. So first, a little bit about us. Working on the Guardian's live app, you might immediately think of iOS languages like Swift or Android languages like Kotlin. And you might ask yourself, so why are you talking about Scala? The short answer is, I don't know Kotlin, and I only know a little Swift. Our team is split up into different disciplines. So we have an iOS team with iOS native devs, an Android team with Android native devs, and my team, which is the server side team. We mainly handle the content API for the app, mobile purchases, mobile subscriptions, and push notifications to name just a few of our main services. And our code base is mainly Scala and TypeScript. For The Guardian, Scala is quite a key language and every new starter is encouraged and expected to learn it. For me personally, having started programming by teaching myself and only knowing OOP, my introduction to functional programming was a steep curve. And on top of that, learning a new language like Scala was also a huge leap for me. And putting the two together can be quite overwhelming. One concept that took me a little longer to grasp was recursion. And this talk is aimed at people in their early days of learning Scala, trying to get ahead around all the new terminology. Hi, everyone. I'm Marjan. Glad to meet you all. As Frankie was saying, working at The Guardian, I very recently had to start to learn Scala. I've only been learning for a few months and similar to Frankie, felt recursion was an important part of my learning. We will discuss what recursion is, how recursion works and how to use it in a real life project. So to put it simply, a recursive function is a function that calls itself. A common use case would be if you needed to iterate over all the elements in a list. Some may ask, what's the difference between a for loop and a recursive function? Here, you see a very common for loop. For me, this doesn't feel very functional and we tend to not use var in functional programming. Var would suggest mutability and not really what we want for a functional program. So in order for us to move away thinking in an imperative or OOP way, we need to stop using var. And therefore, we need to stop using for loops. So what do we do instead? We use recursion. In order to understand recursion, we first need to understand how the list data structure works. A list is made up of a head and a tail. The head is the first element in the list and the tail is composed of all of the other elements that make up the rest of the list. And the last element of a list is always nil. The list type I am talking about is a linked list. A linked list is made up of a collection of cells or nodes. Each of these contains a value and a pointer to the next cell. As previously pointed out, nil always appears at the end of the list, which is important as this is how recursion knows when it has come to the end. The cells I am talking about are called cons. Cons is a term I had never heard of before learning functional programming. Cons is in the language Lisp and has a complex definition, which I could go into detail about here, but for the purpose of this talk, all we need to know is cons is an operator on the list object and means a list with a head and a tail. It is denoted by a double colon as shown here. Before we start using recursion, we also need to know what an empty list and a non-empty list looks like. An empty list can either be 
a list with empty parentheses or the word nil. A non-empty list can look like example one with the list one, two, three, or using the cons operator like the second example. And it's good to know what these look like when reading Scala functions. We previously mentioned that a list has a head and a tail. And again, here the head is one and the tail is two, three. But it's also good for us to know that the tail of the list is also made up of a head and a tail. To show it a different way, the list one, two, three has a head of one and a tail, which is a list of two, three, nil. The tail of the original list has a head of two and a tail of a list of three, nil. This also has a head of three and a tail, which is an empty list. So every non-empty list will always have a head and a tail. And if a list is empty, it has neither a head nor a tail. So let's sum a list with recursion. Given a list of integers, the sum of a list will be the head of the list plus the sum of the tail. First, we know that we are going to be receiving a list of ints and returning a single int. So we can write out sum of list function definition to reflect that. We also need a match expression so we can create different cases. And this is also known as pattern matching. The first case is to evaluate what will, what will happen if the list is empty. Given an empty list of ints, we should return zero. Our second case is what to do if the list contains elements and is not empty. We need to split the list into a head and a tail. So we call our case head cons tail. We know we want to add the head to the sum of the tail as set out at the start. So the return of the expression will be exactly that. Head plus sum of list with the tail. So given a list of one, two, three, four, the output will be 10. It's also worth remembering that our base case, the first case statement in our function, will always evaluate to true at some point. This is so much nicer than a for loop, but how exactly does it work? There are two phases to a recursive call, the winding phase and the unwinding phase. The winding phase happens when the function is first called and ends when the condition finalizes. We don't return anything at this stage, we just wind down the stack. So the first thing to happen will be to see if the list is empty. And if not, we can continue on to the second case statement in our function. We start off with the list one, two, three, four. We split the head one from the tail two, three, four, and we move on. Sum of list receives the list two, three, four. It's non-empty, so we split the head two and the tail three, four. Sum of list then receives the list three, four. It's again non-empty, so we split the head three and the tail four. Sum of list then receives the list four. Again, it's non-empty, so we split the head four and the tail is nil. And then finally, sum of list receives an empty list and it matches the first case, the nil expression. It evaluates and returns zero and the recursive call ends. And then the unwinding phase starts when the previous phase finishes. So we work our way back up the stack and return at each step. We start with the previous instance where sum of list received nil, and this will return zero. 
The previous step is then evaluated, where sum of list received a list of four, and the return is four. The previous step to that is then evaluated, where sum of list received a list of three, four. We take the head three, and we add it to the sum of the tail, and the return is seven. The previous step to that is evaluated where sum of list received a list of two, three, four. We take the head two and we add it to the sum of the tail and the return is nine. And finally, the last step is evaluated where sum of list receives a list of one, two, three, four. We take the head one and we add it to the sum of the tail and the return is 10. Marjan will go into further detail about how stacks work later on. So how can we use recursion in a real life project? Here we have a function that will determine if a credit card number is valid or not. For the purposes of this example, the only cards we deem valid are ones that begin with the number four. We now want to filter out all the valid credit cards in a given list. Again, we are going to pattern match on the credit card numbers using the match expression. Our first case is to check if the list is empty. And if true, we return an empty list. Our second case is when the list is non-empty. And using pattern match, we split the head and the tail, and we then evaluate if the call to our is valid credit card number function with the head element in the list returns true. If it does, we create a list with the head cons, the result of the recursive call applied to the tail. Else, we call the recursive function with the tail and we don't need to know about the head here. Let's break this down further. For our example, we are just using the first three digits of each number to make things easier. We begin with our list of four numbers. We split the list into a head and tail. The head is four, five, three. We check if it begins with four. It does, so we filter it out. The next instance of our function call, we split again. This time, the head is one, two, three. It doesn't begin with a four, so we continue the recursion. The next head of the list is four, five, six. This does begin with a four and we filter that out. The last string in the list doesn't begin with a four, so we continue the recursion and the tail is empty. We evaluate the empty list as nil and end the recursion call. And we then finally return the filtered list of numbers four, five, three, four, five, six. So in summary, to make writing recursion functions easier, we can first write the function signature. We can outline exactly what we want the function's input and output to be. Secondly, using pattern match, we can write the first case of when the list is empty. And thirdly, we can then write the second case of what we want the function to do when the list is non-empty. So let's now talk about tail recursion. A function is called tail rec recursive when the last thing the function does is the recursive call. Before explaining tail recursion in detail, let's talk a bit about the JVM stacks and stack frames to be able to understand why a normal recursion algorithm could be problematic and cause a stack overflow error and why tail recursion can solve this issue. What is JVM stack and what is a stack frame in JVM? Scala language is built on top of the JVM. JVM is the engine that provides the runtime environment in which the compiled code can execute. Stack is the data area in the JVM memory, which is allocated for the execution of our program. It is used to store the order of function executions, function arguments and local variables. 
JVM stack is composed of stack frames. The stack frame contains the state of one function invocation. JVM performs two operations on stack, which is called push and pop. When a method is invoked in JVM, a stack frame is created and placed on top of the stack. While the method is being executed, it stores its parameters, local variables, and computations in that frame. This frame is called the current frame. And while the method is being executed, the code can only access the values in this current stack frame. When the method completes, the frame is popped off the stack. Then the program resumes executing the point just after the method was called. As you can see, the frame 4 is popped off the stack and passes back the result of its invocation to the previous frame. Now, frame 3 becomes the current frame. Now, let's visualize the interaction of our sum function with the stack. As you can see, when the sum is invoked with a list of three items, 1, 2, 3, one stack frame is created and pushed to the stack. When this sum function invokes the first recursive function call with a list of two and three, another frame is pushed. Then the third frame is pushed for the recursive call with a list of three. And finally, for the recursive call with an empty list parameter, the last frame is pushed. This is the last frame because in this function invocation, there's no more, no more call to the fu sum function since this call meets the base case and returns zero. As soon as the function returns a value, its function is popped off the stack and the program goes back to where the sum of an empty list had been called in the previous frame, which is in function sum of list of three. At this point, sum of list of three receives the value of the recursive call it had made and its evaluation completes. Sum of list of three is now popped off the stack and its return value is received in the previous frame for the function sum of list of two and three. The function sum of list of two and three also completes its evaluation and returns its value to the previous frame. Now the program reaches the point in the original function sum of list of one, two, three. As soon as this function returns its result, its frame is also popped off the stack and the program goes back to the point where the function had been called in the first place. But what is the problem with this sum function? If we run it with a large data set, we will get a stack overflow error as you can see it here. Why is that? As you noticed, for every recursive call, a new frame was created and added to the stack. This means as we recurse, more space of the stack is used, meaning more of the memory that is allocated for that stack is consumed. So if you run the sum function for a list of 10,000 items, 10,000 frames will be created. But if the allocated, allocated memory is filled up, no more frame can be pushed because the stack has no more room to add a new frame to make the next function call. Therefore, we would encounter the stack overflow error. Now let's talk about tail recursion. What is tail recursion? As we mentioned earlier, if the recursive call is the last action done by the function, we would say the function is tail recursive. The Scala compiler detects tail recursion and whenever the recursive call happens on a tail recursive function, instead of a new creating a new frame, the compiler reuses the same frame by jumping back to the beginning of the function and updating the parameters of the function with the new values. This optimization is guaranteed by the compiler as long as the recursion occurs as the last thing in the function. The sum function we had 
is not a recursive because the last operation of the function was to add the result of the recursive call to the head of the list. So the last action is the plus operation. How can we change this to make it tail recursive? We follow these steps. First, copying the original function and changing its name to something like sum underscore tail. Giving it a second parameter as the accumulator. The accumulator parameter is the value that will be added to the head in every recursion. Also add the tail rec annotation. Now modify, we modify the implementation of the function to use the new accumulator value. The implementation still has the same case patterns when the list is empty and when the list is not empty. For the empty list pattern, instead of returning zero, the accumulator value is returned. For the non-empty list pattern, the tail recursion happens by calling the function as last thing. So this time, instead of adding the result of the recursive function to the head, we would add the head to the accumulator value as a second parameter of the recursive call. In this approach, the accumulator keeps track of the total sum and when it reaches the base case in the final recursion, it would hold the total, total sum of the list. So now the last thing the function does is the recursive call. And after the recursive call returns, there's no more action. This means this function is tail recursive. And JVM can optimize this function call by reusing the same frame and not adding new frames to the stack. If we want to keep track, if we want to keep the function signature the same as what we had in the original sum function, we can now make the tail recursive function private and call it from inside the initial sum function we had. The accumulator parameter should be set to zero because zero is the identity value for a sum algorithm, meaning zero plus any number is that number. It's worth noting that zero is the same value we were returning in the base case of the non tail recursive fu sum function we had. A note about tail rec annotation. Tail rec annotation is used just as a guide to verify that the function is tail recursive for certain. If you put this annotation on the non-tail recursive sum function, we would get a compilation error unless we change the function to be tail recursive. To prove that sum underscore tail is tail recursive and the compiler doesn't create new frame on every recursion, Let's first add some code and logging to the non tail recursive sum function. As you can see, at the base case where the function returns and there will be no more recursion, we are getting the stack trace array from the current thread. Then we are, we are filtering it to only show the function calls with name sum of list and printing all of the filtered stack trace items. When we now run sum of list with a list of three items, one, two, three, the print line prints four calls to sum of list function. This means at that point, we have four frames in the stack for this function. Now let's do the same experiment with the tail recursive sum function. Again, we add the same code to this function at the base case of the recursive function where the function returns the accumulator value and there will be no more recursion after that. If we run this function with a list of three items, one, two, three, the print line prints one call to the function sum of list underscore tail. This means at that point, there's only one frame in the stack for this function. Now let's use tail recursion again on our real life project. 
just to remind ourselves about the function filter valid credit card numbers. This function is applied over a list of credit card numbers and returns a filtered list of only the valid credit card numbers. We follow the same steps we took previously by copying the original function, changing its name to something like filter cc numbers underscore tail. We make the function private because we want to keep the signature of our original function and call this tail recursive function from inside our original function. We add the tail rec annotation, then we change the function signature by adding the accumulator as the second parameter. Note that now the type of the accumulator is list of string because the function return type is list of string. Then for the empty list pattern or our base case, we would return the accumulator. For the implementation of the non-empty list pattern match, if the card number that is the head of the list is valid, we will append it to the accumulator list and pass it as the second parameter of the recursive function call. If it's not valid, the accumulator alone is passed as the second parameter without any change. Finally, the tail recursive function should be called inside the non-tail recursive function. And the initial value for the accumulator would be an empty list. Again, note that in the original non-tail recursive function Frankie showed you earlier, we were returning this value empty list in the base case of the function, but now it is used as the initial accumulator value. So hopefully by now, we should all understand a little bit better what recursion does, how it compares to tail recursion, and how we can use both of them in our project. The next time you want to use a for loop, maybe try recursion or tail recursion instead. It is worth noting there are built-in methods on the list collection, such as map, filter, fold left, or fold light, and they may be more suitable to use than recursion, but recursion is still an important part of learning functional programming. And under the hood, many of these built-in methods will still be using recursion in their implementation. Thanks for listening to our talk and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.